We helped to assemble the first computer and the internet. We wrote the World Wide Web. And along the way, we also invented television. We invented radio, radar, microwaves, and don't forget, we helped to create the space program and the GPS system. And we physicists love to make predictions. When we helped to assemble the internet, one physicist predicted that the internet would become a forum of high culture, high art, and high society. <laughs> well, today we know that 5% of the internet is pornography. But that's because teenage boys log on to the internet. Just wait until the grandmas and grandpas log on to the internet. Then 50% of the internet will be pornography. <laughs> the difference between the physicists, the chemists? Well, let me tell you a little story. During World War II, the Nazis captured a group of American scientists and called them spies, and they were going to be executed by firing squad. So they put up the, a geologist, a physicist, and a chemist about to be fired away by execution. Well, they, they aimed their rifles at the geologist, and the geologist suddenly said, earthquake, earthquake. Well, in the chaos, the geologist snuck away and escaped. Well, now it was the physicist's time to have him shot. So the Nazis raised their rifles at the physicist. And then the physicist said, lightning, lightning. And again, chaos, everyone ran off and the physicist escaped. And now it was the chemist's turn. They turned their rifles at the chemist. And the chemist said, fire, fire. <laughs> And your brain doesn't require a nuclear power plant to energize it, just a few hamburgers. So how is it possible? And now, because of modern physics, we've learned more in the last five to 10 years than in all of human history. You know, when I was a kid, I used to love reading science fiction. I read about telepathy, that is, reading minds. I read about telekinesis, moving objects with the mind. I read about recording memories, I read about photographing dreams. However, I tried very hard to read people's minds, and I finally came to the conclusion that maybe telepaths do exist, but I wasn't one of them. <laughs> well, today we can do all of the above. I will show you how we photograph thoughts, photograph dreams. One day you will push the play button and see the dream you had the previous night. I will show you how we can record memories about how we can move objects with the mind and read minds. All this because of advanced physics just in the last five to 10 years. The smallest MRI machine that is compatible with the laws of physics is this big. You will have one day an MRI machine in your medicine cabinet. You will have more computer power in your medicine cabinet than a modern university hospital and Here's how we do it. We MRI the brain, look at electrical activity, construct a matrix of 30,000 dots, and a computer program prints this out. These are some of the first pictures of a thought. On the left is Steve Martin. Next to it is the mental image that you create of Steve Martin in your mind, recreated as a photograph. And we can do it for many kinds of objects. Again, these pictures are fuzzy, but hey, look, it's only 30,000 dots. You, uh, a typical picture may have up to a million pixels. On the left, an elephant, a person, an airplane. I asked them what happens if you fall asleep. And they said, yes, they have fallen asleep in this machine. The MRI machine keeps on chugging away and creates an approximation of what you are dreaming about. This has also proven another old wives' tale. There's something called lucid dreaming. Lucid dreaming is when you are awake, when you are dreaming. You know you are dreaming. You can actually walk and control the direction of the dream. They proved it's correct. They took a lucid dreamer, put, her, put him in an MRI machine, and he controlled the direction of the dream. Videotaping a thought. How can you videotape a dream? Well, here's how you do it. This is the brain in an MRI scan. 
you an analyze it for 30,000 centers of electrical activity, and you get 30,000 dots. These 30,000 dots represent a map of energy flows in the brain. Then a computer program recognizes these dots and has a dictionary, and from it creates a picture of what you are looking at. The next big project, already devoted a billion dollars from the European Union and the United States government into this project, is the Brain Project, to create a map. A map of every single neuron in your body. Which means that one day we will understand mental illness, one of the greatest afflictions of humanity, and perhaps even create not just a disk of the genome, but a disk containing your connectome. Every single neuron, all your memories, your desires, your hopes, dreams, encoded in a connectome. And if you have your genome and your connectome on two disks and you put them together, then you may even have, in some sense, a form of immortality. This raises theological, ethical, religious questions. Who are you anyway? If you die, but your genome survives and we can revive your body any time, if we can bring back your consciousness at any time, then did you really die? This raises all sorts of questions about who are we? Are we nothing but information? And then there's the movie The Matrix, where reality itself is nothing but an uploaded software program. Everything you see around you is fake. This is The Matrix. In fact, let me ask you a question. Late at night, just before you go to sleep, have you ever had that weird, bizarre thought that maybe the matrix is right? Maybe the reality you see is an illusion. Maybe it's a software program. Maybe you are the only one that's really real. Have you ever had that thought late at night? And maybe it's all a test to see whether you're smart enough to figure it out, that everything you see is nothing but an uploaded memory. Ever had that idea? Raise your hand if you ever had that feeling. <laughs> you're crazy. <laughs> Give me a break. You think you're the only one in the universe? I'm the only one in the universe. I'm in bed right now. I'm just about to go to sleep. You are nothing but an uploaded memory. Now, is that possible? I will show the answer is yes. Last year, the first memory was successfully uploaded into a brain. I'll talk about that. Something that happened just last year. My colleague, Stephen Hawking, the great cosmologist, he now has lost control over all his bodily functions except his mind. We have now connected his mind to a laptop. Next time you see him on television, look at his right frame of his glasses. There's a chip and an antenna that picks up waves from his brain, decodes it, and allows him to communicate with the world. And so we're talking about brain-machine interface one of the hottest fields now in neurology. We may have the ability to put your consciousness on a connectome and send it into outer space. This is the dream of Isaac Asimov, sending pure consciousness into outer space at the speed of light. No booster rockets, no movies like Gravity anymore, no accidents, pure thought on a laser beam shot at the speed of light throughout the universe. That could ultimately be the destiny of Homo sapiens. On the left, for example, is the brain when it tells the truth. Not much happens. On the right is the brain when it tells a lie. Yes, when it tells a lie. First, you have to know the truth. Then you have to create the lie. Then you have to calculate the consistency of the lie with all the lies you've been telling all these years. <laughs> That's a lot of brain power. Your brain lights up like a Christmas tree. And so we can now see thoughts ricocheting across the brain like a ping pong ball, and we can now re-examine Freudian psychology, old wives' tales. We can now see what's true and what's not. For those of you who have children, you have always suspected that your teenage kids have brain damage. Well, it's true. We can actually show that the prefrontal cortex, right behind your forehead, that's where you are located. Ever wonder where you are? you are located right behind your forehead, that is not fully formed in teenagers, just as many parents have always suspected. <laughs> Another old wife's tale, that when a man sees a pretty girl, he starts to act stupid. <coughs> True. 
you can actually see that blood flow drains from the prefrontal <laughs> cortex of a man when he talks to a pretty girl and he starts to act retarded. <laughs> Absolutely true. This was verified just last year by looking at the brain scans of college kids. Absolutely true. The brain does not feel pain. You can remove the skull and you don't feel a thing. And then when you touch this part of the brain, your left side starts to move. You touch the, this part of the brain and this part of the brain starts to move. And you can cut the link between the left and the right brains. And then some bizarre things began to happen. In a person's brain that is cut in half, two personalities begin to emerge. Different personalities begin to emerge. And each of them try to control the hand. You can literally struggle with the other part of the brain for control of your organs, just like in the movie Dr. Strangelove. There's one documented case where one guy's left brain was an atheist and the other brain was a believer. <laughs> this is true. You can imagine that one day we're going to find somebody whose left brain is Republican <laughs> and his right brain is Democrat. Now, let's talk about the big one. Uploading memories into the mind. Last year at Wake Forest University and also Los Angeles, the first memory was recorded and uploaded successfully. Here's what they did. They took a mouse and they had the mouse learn how to sip water. Then the mouse forgot this trick, but they recorded it. They recorded the hippocampus right there. That is the place where memory is processed. They recorded it. Then after the mouse forgot how to do it, they played it back into the hippocampus and the mouse remembered. This has now been done with false memories. You can actually put false memories into a mouse and they will remember things that they never did. And now we can also reanalyze Freudian psychology. Freud talked about the unconscious mind and we now realize that the mind is like a large corporation. A large corporation has a very small nerve center, a CEO, but the CEO does not have to know everything that's happening in the mailroom. Therefore, most of the brain's activity is unconscious, like a large corporation. Not only that, not only is the unconscious mind necessary, but also emotions. Why do we have emotions? We have emotions because they provide a rapid fire response to emergencies. If you see a tiger, your prefrontal cortex will debate whether or not the tiger is strong, weak, or whatever. Emotions say, run. <laughs> You don't want to debate the finer points of, you know, lion anatomy. So emotions serve a purpose. That is also found in a corporation, which has to have emergency efforts to put out fires independent of the CEO. And we also see the superego, the id, and the ego at work. 